right, I was going to talk, not, not too much about this, I, I've cut out most of this talk, but I've left a little bit in, um, because I wanted to, well, I think you, it, it would be nice for you to hear something about, about this work at least, and this has to do with, well done, yeah, this has to do with nonlinear optics in holocore photonic crystal fiber, so it's this kind of fiber and it's filled with, with gas. Uh, I am going to talk about pressure control and dispersion, and I'm going to jump down to these two topics. I'm going to leave out all this stuff. Again, if there's some time at the end, I can, I can certainly talk about these if someone wants me to. But so, Okay, so pressure control of dispersion. I already talked about dispersion yesterday and how to think about it and how it was a combination or a, or a, a kind of balance between anomalous dispersion of the ge geometrical waveguide and, uh, and the dispersion of the material. So the kind of fibers that we are using in this work mainly, in this, in this work mainly, we don't use photonic band gap fibers. We're using these, these holocore fibers that guide by this anti-resonant reflection uh, uh, mechanism, ARR, I call it. So I couldn't think of a decent acronym for it. Um, I mean, it's been given other names. R, that's right. <laughs> People from Cornwall, they say R. Isn't that right? I think that's right. I'm not sure. So I'm told. So an R is with, uh, <laughs> maybe the most important thing on this slide is that, that for these fibers, they don't have a photonic band gap. They have an, they have an incomplete photonic band gap. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lowering of the density of states in this periodic cladding, which is way not surprising because, because you've removed a lot of the glass and you'd expect the density of states to be lower because there's less glass I mean, in a very, very simple-minded way. Um, so there isn't any photonic band gap, and yet we can get, you know, we get reasonably low loss guidance, about a dB per meter. In some cases, it's quite a bit less than that, but, but it's this sort of order. But it's about a thousand times higher than the very best photonic band gap holocore fiber. So it's a substantially high loss. But for the kind of experiments I'm talking about here, this is perfectly acceptable. And it brings huge advantages with it. One of them is that these, these, these types of fibers guide a very, very broad bandwidths in terms of wavelength. You, you can guide light from the ultraviolet to the infrared in some of these fibers. And in nonlinear optics, extreme nonlinear optics, where you want to generate lots of new wavelengths and do all kinds of things, um, this is a wonderful thing to have. Another feature of these fibers is that uh, they have a very high damage threshold. You can put enormously high intensities into the core. We're talking 10 to the 15 watts per centimeter squared maybe even 10 to the 16 in some cases. So you can easily get to intensities where you can ionize the gas. This is also a very attractive thing if you're working at very high intensities. Um, and it's way, way beyond what you can do with solid glass fibers that have solid glass. But how do they work? And why, is, why, does, all this, why does all this work? Well, the, the key thing is the design of the first layer. So to get this anti-resonant reflection, you need to design the first layer. And this is a structure from the University of Bath. It's this paper here. Very, very nice result. Uh, where these, these, these capillaries, I mean, they aren't really, they're sort of weird shaped capillaries in this case. But the area of these hollow channels is such that when you excite the fundamental mode in the core, it's unable to have a conversation with the modes in these capillaries. When I say have a conversation, I mean it's unable to talk to them, it's unable to couple to them, because they're, they're, they're strongly phase mismatched. So this means you can keep the light in the core for quite a long time, and it, it can actually tunnel through a little bit. You know, it's a very strong reflection, but, but there's a, some possibility of it tunneling into the glass outside and leaking away. But you can get losses of well below 1 dB per meter with this kind of design. Here is, is a more recent structure that we've been, we've been working on, a couple of our papers here, where we've been able to design it so that we can eliminate the higher order modes. It's like an endlessly single mode holocore fiber. Um, this particular case, this involves getting the ratio of D to D correct. Um, and this is the original fiber, the Kagome fiber, that many of you will have heard of, uh, which it guides by exactly the same mechanism um, and uh, this was made by Feta Ben Abid back in 2003. I think we published the paper on this. Um, and we didn't understand how it worked back then. Uh, but you can chuck away all this complicated stuff. Uh, it's, it's completely unnecessary. Just the first 
row of hollow channels that gives that gives this um, broadband uh, broadband guidance um, and so on. And the reason you get ultra broadband guidance is well, there's one way to understand this. This and this is that the it has to do with dispersion. You've got you've got say you've got the index. You've got the core mode, which maybe have an index, let's say here, and you have the index of these capillaries. And if you change the wavelength, this is going to change in some kind of way. You'd like them to stay dephased. I mean, if they become phased, you lose, you get loss. So, so as you change the wavelength, you want those to disperse as slowly as possible as you change the wavelength, so they maintain that, that difference in refractive index. And it turns out that that's exactly what this structure gives you. You can get massive bandwidths of, of guidance. Whereas the tiny band gap fiber, the dispersion is much, much more, is much stronger when you change wavelengths. So, so they have a narrower bands of guidance. Anyway, this structure is ideal for enhancing nonlinear gas light interactions. You just put gas in the structure using gas cells or whatever, um, and you get factors of maybe 10,000 times enhancement compared to a focused Gaussian beam. But the so this is just summarizing what I've said already. Um, but the really neat thing about this is that we have a means of pressure controlling the dispersion. So we start out with, with the hollow, empty, hollow waveguide. It has anomalous dispersion because it's, it's hollow. There's nothing in it. So you know that already. It has anomalous dispersion. And it has fairly small values of dispersion. Telecoms fibers have about 20 times higher dispersion compared to these values. Um, and uh, over a very broad range of wavelengths, from 400 nanometers out to 1.5, the dispersion only changes by one, one picosecond squared per kilometer. This is really weak dispersion. And that's really nice, because when you, when you add gas to the core at any kind of reasonable pressure, I mean, gases are, of course, a dilute. They don't have much refractive index. You, know, you have to make them into a liquid to get high refractive index. But it turns out that this is a very sweet spot in terms of engineering that uh, we, by putting in two atmospheres, 30 atmospheres or so of, of argon gas in this case, the gas itself has normal dispersion in, in this wavelength range. So it lifts this dispersion surface upwards and creates a dispersion zero. For the empty core, the dispersion zero is at, at infinite frequency. I mean, theory, of course, it's, it's not going to be there, but, but that, that's what the theory would tell you. When you add the gas, you just counterbalance the anomalous dispersion, and you can, you can create all these different dispersion curves. Uh, and what is wonderful about this in, for experiments is that for the first time we have, we have an optical fiber where just by changing, turning a knob in the lab, we can change its dispersion radically. So you can actually tune the way the system responds in non optic sense uh, just by changing the pressure. OK, I'm not going to talk about that. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to talk now about uh, simulated Raman scattering. Um, I haven't been following the time. How am I doing this now? It's about an, an hour, isn't it, since I started? OK. So I think what I'll, I'll talk about these two topics, and then maybe we can have a little break for questions. So I hope you're writing down your questions. Yeah? No? OK. <laughs> so I'm, what I'm going to tell you now is, is how we can make use of, this, of this, this, uh, this pressure control of dispersion to do some very nice things with stimulated Raman scattering broadband Raman wavelength conversion. Um, so once again, we always come back to dispersion. It's always the first thing you think about in nonlinear optics, because there's normally some nonlinearity is normally always there, some sort of nonlinearity, but dispersion is a thing you need to control. So suppose we are operating close to a zero dispersion point. Now, when, when you're operating near to a zero dispersion point, we plot a frequency wave vector diagram. And I'm going to be thinking about uh, expanding around the zero dispersion point here. Below that zero dispersion point, we see that the group velocity of the light is faster at higher frequency. So that makes the dispersion down here anomalous. At the top, the group velocity is lower at higher frequency. So we have normal dispersion. And it switches sign at the zero dispersion point. Kind of obvious, yeah? But what is not, I mean, OK, you can see that curve and say, oh, OK, I understand it. Fine, we can get solitons down here, but not up there. But there's some other, other very, very nice thing about this. And it has to do with its shape, um, the fact that it's the, called this S shape. Um, so let, let, let's suppose we, we, uh, we excite, we, we put in a strong narrowband signal. 
at a frequency up here, this red dot. So that we choose this frequency. We pump this system strongly, the gas at that point, and we get stimulated Raman scattering. As, as, uh, as Roy mentioned last night, he talked a little bit about that. But uh, what you find is that you get what we call a Stokes signal generated at a lower frequency. Okay, so you, you, you the phot photons lose some energy to phonons. To, op to optical phonons, actually, or to molecular motion in a gas. And uh, you create some new photons at a different frequency. And in order to do that, what you have to do is change the frequency of these photons by a certain amount, which equals the Raman frequency. So the frequency drops by the Raman frequency. Uh, but you also have to change the, <coughs> the momentum, momentum of the light by this delta beta. So in order to get to that point, we have to change the momentum of the photons by this amount. And this, this the, 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 the vibration of the molecules in time gives us this frequency difference. And the spatial coherence, the, 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 the relative phases of the molecules, give you this delta beta. So this is a spatial thing. It's actually a, a moving fringe pattern. I'm going to show you this in a moment. So we, have a, we kind of have a spatial frequency, and we have a, a temporal frequency. And you need these two, these two things to be exactly right in order to get this to work. And in the process of this, you've got stimulated Raman scattering going, we have created a coherence wave of molecular motion, which has frequency omega r and uh, wave vector delta, delta beta. And this is how it, how it looks, uh, just a little cartoon to give you a, an impression of this. If, if I imagine I take this signal, the optical signal, and this optical signal, and I superimpose them, they have different frequencies, they have different wave vectors, they will produce a, f a fringe pattern. But of course, since there are different frequencies, that fringe pattern will move. So this is the fringe pattern of the light, okay, with the wavelength given by 2 pi over delta beta. That's the coherence length, is this, this, this pitch. And this fringe pattern is able to drive the molecular motion. So it, it, it forces the molecules to vibrate in, in a kind of, uh, not in phase, but to vibrate in such a way as that their, their relative phases are such as to create, to create a traveling a traveling coherence wave. You can see the, the wave is traveling along if I follow the, the motion of the molecules. And this, this translates itself into a, a moving refractive index wave. So the refract you get a, a modulation in refractive index, which is traveling. The molecules themselves stay where they are. And uh, I have a, a wonderful Spanish postdoc called David Navoa, who has some Spanish friends whose who's, uh, interest in life is... is um, is going around, is exploring the web and trying to find out the most, the strangest things that people actually do. You know? uh, he's some kind of social, he's interested in the way people behave. And he discovered this, uh, he discovered this. <laughs> I think he was having a conversation with David. And he said, oh, I know something that might, might, might help you here. This, this is the Thai, this, this is the army of, of Thailand. These are Thai soldiers doing this incredible display. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're oscillating. So this is the individual molecules oscillating. And they're creating, <laughs> creating a coherence wave. And what stuns me is how precise they are. It's just extraordinary. Just amazing. So that, that's a human coherence wave. <laughs> and this is a molecular coherence wave. So now you're never going to forget the concept of a coherence wave, I think. <laughs> OK, so what's the point of this? Well, the point of this is that this process, through this process, we create this coherence wave. And it, if we turn the light off, it will survive for a certain length of time, which is called the coherence time, for obvious reasons. The coherence wave will live for a certain length of time. And within that time, you can then make use of this thing that you've written into the gas. You've written this pattern into the gas. It's like a hologram. It's like a nonlinear hologram of some sort. You can then read it out. So I could say uh, the beauty of this sh S shape is that I can take the frequency wave vector combination that gave me this coherence wave, and I can transpose it down to here, a completely different part of the optical spectrum. And uh, if I put light in here at this frequency, put a signal in here, it could be a weak signal, it could be a strong signal, it doesn't really matter, I will be able to, to the, the, this light will interact with the coherence wave, will we'll, we'll steal its energy. So so, so it, what, what it does is able to take the, into the energy from the individual molecules, extract it from the system, and increase the, the photon energy. So, so we, can, we can actually recover the, the energy from the 
particular motion. And this, of course, another way of looking at that, that is, that this is, is that the entropy of the system has not changed, that the, the entropy of, of this, this molecular motion is very small. And if it, provided you didn't wait too long, it will stay small. But if you wait too long, it loses its coherence and the entropy goes up, it becomes random. And then you can't extract the energy anymore. Okay, but, but so within the coherence time, we can extract the energy and use it to, to upshift uh, a signal in, in frequency in this band. Or you could do it the other way around. We could write it here and we could read it out up here. So it's a kind of nonlinear hierography. It's got, it's got uh, the, the Doppler shift in it. It's got the Raman scattering. It's got all kinds of things. It's, it's, it's got so much physics in it, um, depending on how you look at it. Now, just to show you that it, that it works. Um, here are the results of experiments. Let me explain this. Let's see. Uh, over here is a plot of where the dis zero dispersion wavelength sits. The wavelength of the zero dispersion wavelength as a function of pressure. Again, wonderful system this. We can, we can radically change the position of the zero dispersion wavelength. And what we're doing is we're pumping with a doubled YAG laser at 532 nanometers. This is the pump wavelength. We're creating a Stokes wave down here at whatever the Stokes frequency is. for This is hydrogen, so it's 125 terahertz different. Um, <clears throat> so if we take, for example, and this is hydrogen, so we're working with three atmospheres of hydrogen in a core of about 40 micron diameter. We're writing with this. We're, we're, we're producing a Stokes wave here. So this is the coherence wave we're producing. It's a slightly complicated plot, but this is basically is wave vector and frequency. In this case, you can, you can, you can phase match this interaction. So if we put a signal in here, we could, we could convert from, from somewhere in the, in, the, in the green, maybe, or the blue. We could convert up into the, into the ultraviolet signal. If we change the pressure to 12 atmospheres through this, the zero dispersion point is now shifted somewhere else. I don't know which 12 bar would be this point, yeah. So we can then write with these and read with these. So now the, the reading wavelength is shifted down into the into the, basically the infrared. So we're going from infrared to maybe, maybe the red, somewhere in the red. And at, at 30 atmospheres, we can, writing with the same frequencies, we can now uh, do the readout process in the infrared. And this is just with one piece of fiber, nothing changed, something with the same wavelength. Incredibly versatile, tunable system, mainly because we can pressure tune the dispersion. Here are just some results. If you're interested, that's the paper. So here we've got, well, that's the writing signal. So this is frequency, and this is the, the photon rate, if you like, or something related to the power in the different frequency ranges. So we pump at 532. This is the Stokes signal. There's also a, a second Stokes signal here. Fairly narrow band, as you can see, but that creates a coherence wave. We then deliberately put in a broadband signal because we wanted to see if we could, we could because we knew the, the, the phase matching for this process was very relaxed. You could actually upconvert a fairly broadband signal using this, even though you're writing with a narrowband signal. Because of the nature of the dispersion surfaces, the process is, is, is relatively insensitive to phase mismatch. So we put in this pretty broad signal extending from, I don't know what it is, it's a couple of hundred nanometers maybe. We were able to convert that to an upshifted signal with a conversion efficiency of about 80% in this case. And you can see the signal is pretty well preserved, if just comparing the, if comparing the two. There's also evidence of a much, much weaker signal, minus 40 dB here, which is um, the second, second, second uh, anti-Stokes band. What was the gas? Hydrogen. Yeah, because it has the biggest frequency shift. So. So related to this, and actually this, there's going to be a connection between this and what I'm going to talk about in the final uh, the stuff about optomechanics. This, this has to do with, uh, with uh, something called Raman gain suppression. And I'm calling it dramatic Raman gain suppression because it really is dramatic in this, in this case. And it makes use of, of this idea of this S-shaped curve, actually. Um, so Raman gain suppression and a collinear geometry. So what's this all about? Well, it turns out that by tuning the pressure carefully, we can find conditions in the system where the <clears throat> if we pump at a certain frequency, so we put light in, say, at this frequency, the Stokes conversion process would generate this frequency, and we generate this coherence wave. Okay, That's what you've seen already. But it turns out that 
at that precise frequency, this coherence wave will be perfectly phase matched for conversion to this frequency, to the anti-Stokes. So the Stokes process and the anti-Stokes process use exactly the same coherence wave. It has exactly the same frequency and exactly the same wave vector. So, okay, in this case, uh, was, we were also thinking about high rotor modes, but uh, ignore that for the moment. Just, just think about this. This is the, yeah, the, the fundamental mode of the system. You may say, well, so what? You know, well, what is that? What, how, how does that affect anything? Well, let, let's, that's what this little thing is here. So let's just think. This is a pump photon going into the system at, at this, this central frequency. And that's meant to represent a, a vacuum fluctuation, a kind of one of these half h bar omega things uh, at the Stokes frequency. You need to have that to, to trigger this event. So this, this stimulates the process. And after this, after this photon encounters the molecule which is stationary, what you find is that the, the, the thing that triggered the event goes through without change. But what we've done is to change the frequency of the light by the Stokes frequency. So we've generated a photon down here. OK, now the, now the molecule is, is in its, its excited state. So next thing that happens is another pump photon comes along. Because you know, we're not just putting one photon in. We're putting lots of photons in at this, this pump frequency. Another photon comes along, and it encounters this molecule in its excited state. It collides with it and gets upshifted in frequency. And this happens with very high probability. So. Going from the beginning to the end state, the system looks just the same from the molecule's point of view. The molecule has basically nothing's happened to it. It's still in the ground state. <clears throat> um, so this, this, is, this is the basis of Raman gain suppression. And actually, this was first suggested by Bloomberg and Shen back in 64 or 65, I think. They first suggested this. They did the mathematics, of course, of it to show that it would happen. And uh, there was an experiment in bulk gas by Mike Duncan, I think it was, and some of his co-workers in, in the States at Naval Research Labs, where they observed Raman gain suppression in a kind of ring. So you put a very strong pump wave into the gas, and you saw a dark ring in the Stokes, which corresponded to gain suppression. But, but you got lots of Raman elsewhere, so it wasn't a very clean experiment. But here we're able to do this in a perfect collinear geometry in, in the hollow core fiber. And uh, it, it, this, this works remarkably well, get dramatic gain suppression in this case. Because we can tune the pressure precisely to where it needs to be, uh, these are some experimental results. Um, so let's see. Um, <clears throat> this is the Stokes signal. And this is theory. So in theory, we would expect the, 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 the fundamental mode, the LP01 mode, to the gain suppression goes, gets actually it goes really to zero here. There's absolutely no conversion here. You're completely right at the beginning of this, of this process. Even when one photon creates a Stokes photon, it's immediately killed. It, you're kind of completely preventing any possibility of stimulated Raman scattering, which is interesting because it means that maybe we can explore for the first time the quantum, what's going on on a quantum level in stimulated Raman scattering, right? You, you can, we, can, we can pump the system really hard and still not get into the stimulated regime. We're still in a spontaneous regime. So we can make measurements in this spontaneous regime that you couldn't imagine doing any other way. We haven't done that yet for reasons which have to do with this intermodal uh, system. The, the waveguide supports another mode, so you can get stimulated Raman scattering into the other mode as well. That creates a slightly more complicated coherence wave, but, but still it, it, it can work. Um, and, this prevents us from seeing perfect gain suppression. But anyway, modeling tells us that the, the LP01 mode will be suppressed very strongly, and also the, the, the anti-Stokes, these will both be very strongly suppressed. If we detune from perfect phase matching, we find these points where the anti-Stokes can be quite strong. This has been known for some time. But because of the higher order mode, it, we, we, although we kill the, the conversion to the fundamental mode, we, we, we do see conversion into the into the higher order mode at this point. So this is the reason it doesn't go to zero in the, in the experiment. Um, but this, uh, the other thing is, you know, you think a nonlinear process, it becomes more efficient if you put more power in. Turn off the power, you know, you're gonna get more, you're gonna, it's gonna respond better, it's gonna be more interesting. 
In this case, it gets less and less interesting because you, if you pump hump more, more, if you pump with more power, all that happens is that the gain suppression band gets broader. So it doesn't help to have higher power. It's better to have lower power if you want to generate a signal. It's really bizarre. It, it turns not only on its head in some senses. Um, and one of the things it does, which we're exploring at the moment, that because this is killing off forward stimulated neuron scattering, because you've killed the forward process, you, you get a very efficient backward process. So we, we, get a, we get a wonderful opportunity to explore backward wave interactions. And I, I love backward wave interactions because they, they can oscillate and they can do all sorts of weird things, form domains, all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, um, certainly in electronics, that's well known. But in optics, this hasn't been really possible to, to, to do it. And I think this may give us a means of doing that. Looks like that's all I was planning to say on today, at least on nonlinear optics. So I'll be happy to take some questions. Anybody wants to? <clears throat> So when you mentioned the read, uh, write and read process yeah. uh, with the Raman scattering, uh, you said that you could uh, write it and uh, read after a short period of time. What's the typical lifetime of the uh, uh, signal that you can read? Well, it depends on the pressure. It depends on all sorts of things. But it's typically in the nanosecond range. Yeah. I mean, typically, we, do, we sort of do this. We put the pulse in, and then shortly afterwards, put another one in. Actually, you can use also do do cars with this very, very, very nicely, using the same idea. So, it is coherent anti anti whatever it's called anti steel. Where are the written down questions? Ah, one at the back. Uh, excuse me. I have a question about about the first part. Yeah. Talk. Uh, on the twisted stuff. I know. Yeah, because you talked about the the relation that you have with topological insulator. Yeah. But uh, I mean, if uh, this analogy go further, uh, can you, I know, integrate over the Brillouin zone to get a kind of bare reflex of it, which we related to that number of torsions that you have. I didn't quite understand that. Maybe you could yeah, have a because in the when we are talking about the quantum Hall effect, yeah. When you calculate the Bary flux over the Brillouin zone, you get that n, which appear in the conductive hall. Okay. Do you have something similar here? I'm not sure. I I, I haven't looked at that analogy closely. Maybe you can tell me. Ah, okay. <laughs> now maybe I, should, I certainly probably should look at this analogy. I'm sure there must be some interesting things we can learn from quantum hole effect. Uh, but but I, I don't, I, I'm not in a position to say anything intelligent about that. Uh, okay. I mean, I could do a Donald Trump and just talk, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, uh, again in the uh, write and read thing, uh, you showed that these curves that you change the pressure inside of the, the fiber and you actually change the write and read uh, frequency yeah. and uh, uh, both the, the frequency and the frequency relation between write and, write and read, yeah. it seems. Why does that happen <laughs> with, with pressure, actually? I don't quite How does it that. actually? Uh, why, why does pressure change this write and read? Uh, why does it change this? Yeah, uh, I mean, is it uh, you can't write and read in these pressures in other frequencies, or uh, I don't know. Is it um, what, what the question is, I mean, the, the, this <clears throat> we, we're always writing with the same frequencies. All we're doing is changing the pressure of the gas for these different curves. It's the same system. We just change the pressure of the gas. And then depending on the pressure of the gas, we can convert the signal, say, in the infrared or in the ultraviolet, just depending on the pressure. I mean, the reason this works goes right back to, let's just, uh, it goes right back to <clears throat> this, this plot. Yeah, okay, so, so, so we're able to change the whole dispersion landscape. Okay. And, 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 and this, 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 this business of gain suppression and so on happens around the zero dispersion points. So we might be, for example, 
writing it, writing here and then reading here, or writing here and reading here or something. Who, you, so that's, that's, this is the reason. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. One more question here. Um, you said that the gas you were using was hydrogen. Mm. What will happen if you use another kind of gas, maybe oxygen, there is? Yeah, uh, well, you, you could use oxygen, nitrogen, any, any molecular gas. And, uh, well, they, they may have less ram and gain, for example. And that's one consideration. But the biggest difference would be that the frequency, the frequency uh, different, the ram and frequency would be lower because the molecules are heavier or maybe they're, they're bonded less strongly or something. So the, the ram and frequency shift. So of other gases are always lower than hydrogen. It's one of the reasons we work with hydrogen. It's not because we like danger, <laughs> but because the frequency shift is so big and, and, and because the gain is so high. And, and actually, if you have anything to say about that in terms of Raman gain is that we operate in, in, at high, very high frequencies in the ultraviolet. The Raman gain becomes enormous, enormously higher, which, ha, which, has, uh, which is also very interesting because it suggests that we can make some extremely efficient devices in a very difficult range of the spectrum where it's hard to make, to get good lasers and, uh, you know, to make good sources. So that's also quite interesting to us at the moment. Yeah. Okay, I guess we continue for the next lecture. Okay, so I've, I think I'm going to do another half hour and that'll be it, yeah? I mean, I think I two hours, wasn't it, from 8.30? Yeah. Yep. Um, oh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, if you want to take more questions or take a break, I don't know. Or just follow up. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go on with the next, the next bit then, so see how it goes. Um. <clears throat> okay, um. so we're on to the fourth topic, which is optomechanics in PCF. And I know many of you work in optomechanics, uh, doing some really beautiful stuff. Um, what we have been doing is, is really, as you can imagine, is, is, is making use of, of, these, uh, of, the, of the, the fact that we can make some nanoscale structures with glass in optical fiber form and, and explore the optomechanical or the optoacoustic response of, of the fibers. Um, OK, so my definition of optomechanics goes all the way from optoacoustics to laser tweezer, tweezer experiments. I'm going to give you some little snapshots of some experiments we've done, done recently um, in connection with guiding particles in hollow core fiber. And I'm going to finish up with, um, <clears throat> with the, the optomechanical nonlinearities in what we call a dual nanoweb fiber. So let's get started. So all optical driving of gigahertz resonances. <clears throat> so this, this is. Um, action and back action between light and vibrations. So say, suppose we start with a pulse of light. We know that through electrostriction, this will create strain in, in the solid material and therefore create some kind of acoustic wave or high frequency acoustic wave. This sound wave will act then back through the stress optical effect on the light. And under some circumstances, this can be a virtuous circle, so they, they interact on each other. You get back action and action and back action and action. And the light can end up driving a very strong acoustic vibration. And in the process, you can generate new frequencies of light. Because the, the, the sine wave itself is, is a refractive index modulation in time, like a phase modulator. So we can generate new frequencies of light. So that, that's what this is about. Um, so you're getting used to frequency wave vector diagrams. I use these a lot, as you can see. So this, this is a classic undergraduate calculation for what phonons do in a diatomic lattice. The reason I'm telling you this is that there's a nice analogy between this and what I want to talk about in the fibers. So I take a diatomic lattice. These are two atoms of different masses that are, that are, that are connected to each other through a bond. Um, and if you solve the dispersion relation for this, which is straightforward to do, again, you, you use Bloch's theorem to do this. Um, we find we have an acoustic branch. We have an acoustic branch down here. And there's a stop, there's a stop band at very high frequency. 
this is very high spatial frequency. That's the that's the that's A is the is the pitch. Okay, so this really is a very these are atoms, so this is a this is angstroms, this this thing. So this is a very large wave vector. And then as we go up to the other side of this stop band, we, we end up with uh, the optical branch, the acoustic branch and the optical branch. And here we have optical phonons. And interesting thing that I want you to remember, which you know already, but I'm just reminding you, is that this optical branch hits the axis and we get a cutoff here. If you go above that point, there, there isn't any, there's nothing at higher frequency, but the band is flat. And there's a cutoff frequency, the optical frequency. And in fact, that, that is directly related to the Raman frequency of, of, a, of, of a material or of a gas or whatever. Of course, a gas, you don't have this kind of picture. You have just isolated molecules. Um, uh, but the optical phonons that you create, this coherence wave, basically is created up, up here, where the group velocity is close to zero. Um, and um, uh, of course, an isolated molecule you can't say whether it has a group velocity or not. I mean, it just, it just sits and oscillates. Uh, but if it's a connected solid material, then you can actually define some kind of dispersion relation as, as we have here. So this, this interaction is, is uh, so let's just think about down here. The, for, acoustic, for the acoustic branch, we, we get, we, you can see we, we can get for, from modest frequencies, not, not too high a frequency, we get a very large wave vector. So you can have a frequencies of, um, you know, not, not enormously high and get a wave vector that's large enough to allow you to brag, to brag scatter light backwards. And that's, that's stimulated Brillouin scattering in a normal sense on, on this branch down here because of the, the fact that it has a slope. Uh, there's a picture of Brillouin, 89 to 69. So we jump up to the top. And now we have Raman, 88 to 1970. So he lived a little bit longer. Oh. Oh, he lived the same length? No, no, a little bit longer, two years longer. This is Raman scattering, and this all happens up here with optical phonons. And if we look at the dispersion of the light, that this, um, the, the, on this diagram, the wave vector of the light is very much smaller, but it has a very high frequency. So you can get a point where they cross. And here we can get polaritons forming. We get coupling between light and optical phonons. And that's, that's where stimulated Raman scattering happens on this diagram. OK, so just, just remember that for the moment. Now let's think about an optical fiber. So here on the left is a standard single mode fiber. It's uh, telecoms fibers typically have a core diameter of 9 microns. The overall fiber is 125 microns in diameter. If we think about acoustic vibrations in this structure, well, the core isn't going to be very good at confining acoustic vibrations because the in difference in material properties is very, very small. There's a little bit of confinement, but it's quite weak. The main thing is that the outer boundary of the fiber will reflect acoustic waves back in. So if there's some kind of vibration, it'll be a vibration of a cylindrical object, like the vibration of a, of a, of a, of a drum, for example, a circular object. It's very similar to kind of modes form here based on vessel functions. But it turns out that it's ambient temperature, KT, thermal vibrations are, the thermal energy is enough to excite these vibrations in a fiber. And they can then cause fluctuations in the phase of the light that's traveling in the And this proved to be a problem for guys that were trying to do some quantum optics experiments. They were trying to do what's called squeezing of the, um, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, the optical signals. And they, they had great trouble with these, these, uh, these, these, these acoustic vibrations in, in the core. I, I think they didn't, they didn't like this effect, but they had to understand it. So they gave it a very ugly name, which was Gorbs. Gorbs. Sounds terrible in English. Gorbs. <laughs> it stands for Guided Acoustic Wave Brillouin Scattering. But they really wanted to get rid of it. They didn't like it, OK? So I try not to use this, because I, I think these, these effects can be useful sometimes. So that, that was these people. And then another very nice paper from Dianoff. You heard about him last night. You saw a picture of him, actually. He's one of the grand old men of fiber optics uh, based in Moscow. He, he realized that, that uh, it's a very interesting idea that if a very short pulse of light was traveling along the fiber, it, it was like a kind of shock. Because it's very short. It's like, again, a hammer hitting, hitting a bell. Bang, you know. So, so it, this would create through electrostriction an acoustic wave that would travel outwards from the core in all directions, hit the outer surface, and then come back in again and crash into the core. 
And if at that instant another pulse arrived, that pulse would feel the effect of that. So, so you'd have a, what we call a non-local non um, uh, effect between one pulse and the next, a non-local interaction, which is, which is mediated by, by the acoustic vibration. And he suggested that this could be interesting for I mean, people who thought about using this for mode locking lasers and so on. It's a very weak effect, so those experiments weren't so successful, but nevertheless a fascinating idea. So let's think about PCF. Now we are able to make cores that are much smaller than this. So that this, this one is about a micron in diameter. And we can also surround the core with large hollow channels. So we can make a very large index contrast between the core and the surrounding material. So that, that means we can confine the light very tightly. But it also means that we can conf confine the acoustic vibrations very tightly. Acoustic wave, the, 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 uh, the impedance mismatch, somebody used that phrase yesterday, the impedance mismatch for the acoustic vibrations, acoustic waves between the core and the hollow channels is huge. So we can confine the acoustic vibrations very well. So we can confine both light and vibrations in, in the core. So we, get an we can get an intense optoacoustic interaction in the core as a result of that. So more than that, Gustavo, thank you for this. You know this guy? <laughs> yeah, it's a very nice simulation. This is just one example of a torsional-like acoustic mode in one of these in one of these fibers. Of course, it doesn't quite distort as much as that in reality, but but it gives you a feel for what it's like. So, how does this form? Well, it forms by the acoustic waves bouncing up and down inside the core. They're very strongly reflected. It doesn't matter what angle they they hit this interface. They're always going to be strongly reflected, and uh, if we if, we, if this zigzag, as it becomes steeper and steeper, the group velocity gets smaller and smaller. That's kind of obvious, because if you want to go from A to B, the, the light has to do many, many of these things, so it travels very slowly along the axis. This is a case where group and phase velocity definitely, one goes up, the other goes down, and vice versa, which is kind of what you expect from dispersive materials. So it's nothing to do with curved space. Um, uh, but the consequence of this is that the phase velocity can be extremely high. And uh, you can easily find uh, conditions where the phase velocity of this very slow acoustic wave matches that of light. So you can get phase matching between light in the core and the, uh, acoustic, the, the, the guided acoustic wave, which allows you to get, uh, first of all, we've got good overlap between vibrations and light. But here we also have the opportunity for phase matching. OK, so if we look at the dispersion relation for these, these, uh, these guided acoustic waves, they will have a cutoff frequency. That's when these, the zigzag is, is perpendicular to the, to the axis of, of the fiber. And below that frequency, you, you won't get any mode. But as we go above that frequency, we get a dispersion relation. But it's a flat band. It's a Raman-like band. I talked about opt optical phonons and Raman scattering and so on. This is also a flat band, so in terms of the physics, it's very similar to Raman scattering. If I then jump up into the optical frequency domain up here at much higher frequencies, and by the way, the frequencies of these acoustic vibrations are just a few gigahertz. So this is a very, compared to the frequency of light, this is very tiny. So if I think about transferring that up into the optical domain, I get a, I get a frequency range here that might be 20 gigahertz, 30 gigahertz, still a very, a very narrow frequency range over which the optical dispersion is pretty much a straight line. So the group velocity is pretty much constant. So we can plot the optical dispersion as a straight line. So now let's think what would happen if we pump this system with some pump light and some Stokes light. So we, we take a laser signal at this frequency and we, we have a single sideband modulator generate uh, Stokes frequency, lower frequency, and pump it pump the system with high power, then we're going to create um, a beat note between these two signals that has this, this wave vector and this frequency. If we transfer that down here, and we've chosen the frequency difference to equal 2 gigahertz, you can always find a point on this yellow curve where the slope here corresponds to the slope here, where these are identical. If I change the... Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, so if the dispersion of the light is slightly different, it doesn't matter. It just tilts to a different angle. 
you know, if this is a slope like this, it'll tilt to a different angle. You can always find, you can always find a phonon that, 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 that you can drive in, in this way, provided the frequency difference is equal to 2 gigahertz, which is very like Raman scattering, actually. And if you do this, you can generate lots of, lots of new sidebands. And what we're doing, in fact, is driving the vibration. This is a, a breathing vibration of the core. We're driving vibrations like this using light. So the intense optoacoustic interaction in the core allows us to drive, to drive this, this motion of the core. And of course, it then acts back on the light. And in the process of acting back on the light, you generate new frequencies, new frequencies of light higher and lower. OK, I, I call this stimulated Raman-like scattering, SRLS, because to me, this is just like Raman scattering. Uh, it obeys the same equations. The physics is almost identical. To call it Brillouin scattering, just because it has acoustic vibrations, I think is confusing. Just, that's my view of this anyway. You can do experiments. Uh, this is, uh, these are some experiments we did. We put in a strong pump and a stoke signal. We excited this acoustic wave in the core. And uh, as a result, you can convert power from the pump to the stokes. Uh, here's one of the measurements. Um, we've, th this is the pump frequency in the stokes. You can see that, that we've got strong conversion to, to the stokes. They were initially the same, had the same uh, amount of power in those two bands. There's also some high rotor bands created here as well. Uh, we can then. With this system, we can tune the frequency difference and measure the gain bandwidth of this process. It turned out to be about 15 megahertz. That's related to the lifetime of the, of the phonons uh, trapped in the core. We can pump that system at higher power, higher and higher powers. So these are the two pump frequencies. And we go up to half a watt. We get more and more sidebands created as a result of, of, this, of this interaction. And uh, just using the standard equations of Raman scattering, we get very good, ah, it's, there's water there, I'm fine, thanks. We get very good agreement between this. So this is just to, to show that um, we can indeed view this as, as, as a kind of Raman, a kind of synthetic Raman scattering, if you like. So what we're doing with this is, um, is, is just to give you one example of how this, I mean, this was just curiosity driven initially. And uh, I worked a lot with Gustavo and actually, actually Paolo Danese too who's standing over there. They both worked on things related to this. But, uh, but recently, we find a very nice application for this, which is to mode locking of, of fiber lasers. And I've just got one slide on this. There's a paper on this if you're interested in following it up. Um, so this is a fiber ring laser, erbium doped fiber amplifier, which is pumped in two directions. We want quite a reasonable amount of gain and isolated to make it go in one direction. And there's various other things in here, nonlinear elements that create and polarizers that create um, a saturable absorber. Uh, but the key component here, all these other components are well understood and known. Key component here is the, uh, a short length, only 60 centimeters of solid core PCF. Looks like this. And uh, you have to tweak the system to get it to, get it to go. But um, you can actually arrange things so that, so that it, it produces short pulses of light. Now, if, if, you, if you've got this thing to mode lock without the fiber in there, it would mode lock at 16 or 17 megahertz, because that corresponds to the round trip frequency in this particular, depends on the length of the fibers and so on. Um, the average dispersion in the loop is anomalous. So you can view this as a kind of average soliton laser. Um, uh, but when we, by having the PCF in there, the, these pulses are able to drive the acoustic resonance in the core. So the core begins to vibrate at 2.2 gigahertz in this case, a much higher frequency than this. And then, then over time, um, it, it, it's, it's the system, if you pump it correctly and adjust everything right, we, we can actually make this, this laser produce mode lock pulses at 2.2 gigahertz. And it's, it's just, it goes, it's, it's so stable, you can leave it running for weeks. It, it doesn't drift. It just, just sits there going. And maybe the, the, the amplifier will blow up or something. But, but this is a very, very stable thing. Because the interaction between the light and the acoustic vibration is so intense. It's a passive low mode locking mechanism. Um, and uh, we do get solitons coming out. And you heard about these Kelly sidebands. We have lots of them here. Still don't quite understand them, actually. Maybe Roy will explain them <laughs> some later date. Um, but, but anyway, it's, it's, this confirms that it is indeed a soliton, a soliton laser. We're doing all sorts of things with the system. We, we recently were able to encode 
uh, digital signals in, in the system by erasing certain pulses. It turns out that these pulses at this very high repetition rate, they're all independent lasers. But, but the, the acoustic vibration is like the conductor of an orchestra, you know? He gets the orchestra to be in time and everyone to play together. He's, the, the acoustic vibration is forcing the, these pulses to behave themselves and be in time, but there's nevertheless, they're all independent lasers, mode locked at 16.8 megahertz, more or less. It's sort of interesting. It's not quite a mode locked laser, it's something different. Anyway, so that's, that's that. Okay, trapping small objects in hollow core fiber. Um, I think probably this will be my last topic, actually, this one. There might not be time for this. <clears throat> So this is about laser tweezers. Um, one slide to introduce it. Back in 1922, there were men who were using light to propel themselves up into the sky. Did you know that? No? You, you didn't know that. So this is something new for you. Yeah. I don't know whether this is supposed to be light. I don't know what it's supposed to be. And this guy looks very um, relaxed. I don't know what he's carrying there. It looks a bit frightening. Uh, this is a magazine for boys. You know, girls weren't supposed to read this sort of thing back in 1922. <laughs> Called Science and Invention. Cost 25 cents. It's quite expensive, I would guess, for 1922. And I never looked at 904. I just liked the picture. So what we're not actually doing with people, at the moment at least, maybe later we'll do with people. <laughs> Any of our volunteers, just get in touch. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if light comes along and hits an object, we've got a certain number of photons per second going in. They get reflected, certain reflection coefficient. Some of them get transmitted. Um, you get an optical propulsion force, which is proportional to the power. You know this very well. I know this is easier to calculate. Um, you can put some numbers in for so, uh, something five microns in diameter, optical power 100 milliwatts, and so on. You can get huge values of acceleration for relatively modest power levels. Just because of the scale of everything is different. The particles so so small and light, and, and, and um, yeah. So these are pretty high forces compared to the size of the uh, <clears throat> compared to the power you're using. Of course, Arthur Ashkin did all this work in in the early 70s um, at Bell Labs. Um, discovered that you could trap dielectric particles just above the focus of a lens, um, and this was a result not just of a propulsive force, but also some refractive forces that actually pushed the particle down, um, and also trapped it in the middle. So it got trapped, couldn't move sideways, and it, it ended up in a stable position just above, just above the focus. And there might have been gravity in there too. You didn't need gravity. was usually much less, much weaker force compared to the optical forces, which as you, I just showed you could be in the order of hundreds of, of g. So what are we doing? Well, we're, we're, we're basically taking particles and launching them into hollow core fiber. This could be liquid-filled hollow core fiber. It could be air-filled, all kinds of things. But one of the techniques that we have been using a lot is, is a Doppler speedometer, a Doppler symmetry, where we light in, pushing the particle along and tracking it. Some of the light gets reflected with a frequency shift because the particle's moving. We can then take this frequency shifted light and interfere it with some light that's reflected off the end face and get a beat note on a detector. Um, you could also do heterodyning uh, to make sure you understood which direction the particle is moving in, but uh, this is the simplest experiment. So this gives you a direct measure of the velocity of the particle. I don't know if any of you have met Ted Hench, the Nobel Prize winner from 2005, who has been measuring frequency to very high accuracy. He made a statement once. He said, if you want to measure something very accurately, measure a frequency. Don't try and measure anything else. Measure a frequency. And uh, it's equally true here. We Here we're actually measuring a frequency. And if you do this correctly, we can, we can actually measure the position of the particle to half a fringe, to half the wavelength of the light, over hundreds of meters potentially. So we're talking, what, half the wavelength of light? It could be 400 nanometers maybe, depending on your wavelength. Resolution over hundreds of meters. So something else that's maybe of interest to you, uh, some of you, um, if, if you fill <clears throat> one of these hollow core fibers with, with liquid, uh, you can show maybe water or something like that. 
um, and the index is less than that of the glass. Okay, so water is 1.33, the glass is 1.4. You can use a scalar approximation to estimate the um, guidance band, or this this could be, I say, guidance band. Just just the characteristics of the guidance get shifted to shorter wavelength when you fill the structure with with a liquid, and uh, the relationship is this this one here. So the <clears throat> the, the wavelength to which this guidance band shifts is given by the wavelength if the, if the core is just air, the fiber has just got air in it, times this square root factor where that's the index <clears throat> of the liquid and this is the index of, of the glass. And this allows you to, for example, with water, it turns out that this is 0.55 more or less, this, this ratio. So, so this allows, you, allows us to design the holocore fiber so that it will, it will guide a certain wavelength that we want to do some experiments with when it's liquid filled. So that's a picture of an experiment where we filled the optical fiber with liquid. Um, it's being held in place by optical forces coming from, from the left. And actually, we're flowing liquid in the opposite direction. Um, and so the particles come to a stop here. And if you, I don't have a video of this, but it's actually rotating. It's sitting there rotating as a result, I guess, of an imbalance of viscous forces. And then if we turn up the power and push the particle in, then these are a succession of video frames of the particle at different positions. It's traveling at about 100 microns, uh, 100 microns or so a, a second in, 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 this, in this particular case. You can easily balance the optical forces with the, the viscous forces of the fluid. So here we have uh, a plot of, say, 100 milliwatts of power with um, a pressure gradient of a certain size. We can make the, make the particle stationary. This is interesting because we're interested. We're talking to chemists and people working with, with small particles. Sometimes they'd like to be able to hold the particle in a liquid stationary and maybe pass some chemicals through and see what happens to the particle. Look at its properties, fluorescence maybe, something like that. It's a way of holding a particle in a very well-controlled environment. This could also be a living cell. We're talking to biologists about this as well. They're interested in looking at one, just one cell and the effects of different chemicals on it perhaps gives us a way of measuring the mechanical properties of the cell. There's all kinds of, kinds of opportunities there. Is the, is the sound on? You've got to hear this. Can we turn up the volume a bit? you think that is? Anybody, any ideas? No? Nobody has an idea. Well, th this is the Doppler bit of symmetry measurement. And the particles moving along in a liquid filled Holocore fiber, what happened there? It's, it's being pushed by the light in this direction. And, and uh, that ooh, ooh, sounds like a Doctor Who theme or something. The velocity is going up and down, correlated with the, f the frequency. It's getting bigger here, that ooh, ooh. Yeah? And this, this length here, like this, is, this is about a centimeter, but this, this length here corresponds to the beat length between the first high order mode and the fundamental mode. So on average, the particles being pushed along, but because of the beating between these modes, the actual force of the particle field changes periodically with position. So that's why you get that sort of stuff. So that's one. Another one, this is Garbas and Euser. There's a postdoc and a student who worked on this. This is spooky music of the spheres. So this time we put in two spheres, OK? Light's coming from here, sphere A and sphere B. Sphere A is approaching B. B decides it wants to move on. Oh, it's speeding up. And A's got stuck. Oh, there's A going again. <laughs> now, these two guys are really having a conversation. Actually, it goes on much longer than that. 
there's a happy ending to the story. They end up going together in, in a wonderful harmony together, moving at the same velocity. I don't know what happens, but somehow they got trapped at a certain distance apart. Maybe they got spliced, got married, I don't know. Possible. So another, another funny result here, these are both, these are all very small things. I, I don't think I will talk about this unless you want me to. But um, this is now an air-filled holocore photonic crystal fiber. Um, experiment is the same kind of thing. There may be a little more detail about this. We have a launching beam uh, using laser tweezers. We capture a particle, hold it here, and then we turn on the launch beam. This pushes the particle in into the core. And in the air-filled case, it's a bit more complicated to do this. In the liquid case, it's quite easy because the particles don't move around too much. But in air, it's, it's a bit trickier. But you can do it. So this is Oliver Schmidt, who got his PhD a few years ago now. He, he did this experiment. He came up with this phrase, fear, fear of the dark. So he was, uh, he'd, he'd, he'd been working very hard to, to launch particles into an air-filled holocore. It was a difficult experiment, um, just a very difficult experiment. He finally succeeded and got the particle in there. And then he was very keen to measure the velocity. And he didn't have the Bovella symmetry setup going. You know, so he didn't have any way of measuring the velocity directly. So what do you do? Well, you take a black pen and you mark. You make a mark on the fiber, make a second mark over here, and get a stopwatch. So that's how he's going to measure velocity. Seems like a very intelligent thing to do. And in the absence of anything else, there he is. Very safety conscious, of course, which is always important with lasers. So this is what happened. This is a video of what happened. So there it goes. Bounces off something. There's nothing there. The core is empty. It's got air in it. That's all. Five times slower. You saw that, I think, already. Here it comes. Boom. It's bouncing off nothing. <laughs> There's nothing there except, except gas. It was extremely reproducible. Once, once it got to this rest position and bouncing off something invisible, you could turn up the power and it hardly moved. It more or less stayed where it was. And this was a mystery for us. It was wonderful discussing it. What on earth is going on here? <laughs> what on earth could this be? Anyone got any theories? Sorry? Yeah, but what does the mark do? And that was, yeah, yeah it has to be, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's definitely the mark. The mark is the key here, yes. Well, I mean, we're putting in a few hundred milliwatts of power, maybe. It's coming along. The particle itself scatters light very strongly. As you can see in the movie, you get lots of scattered light. So lots of light uh, is scattered around the place. And the light then encounters the dark mark. It heats that, 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 that heats up quite quickly. It's a lot of power. You can easily get up to maybe 70 degrees Celsius or so. So the whole fiber heats up here. Then we end up with a temperature gradient between here and here. So it's hotter here and cooler here. And this is where something you may not, maybe nobody of you have heard. Some of you may have heard of Knudsen pumps. Has anyone heard of Knudsen pumps? Knudsen number? No? Knudsen number is the, ratio, is the ratio between the mean free path of the molecules in a gas and the size of the chamber in which the gas is sitting. If the Knudsen number is around 1, the molecules can traverse the entire chamber and not crash into another molecule. OK? So that's the Knudsen number. It turns out in this system, without going into too much detail, that because of the temperature gradient, you have a Knudsen pump forming. So the Knudsen pump acts within, within a, a layer which is about the thickness of the mean free path. You, you're, you're pumping molecules from the cold to the hot. The molecules move from the cold to the hot. And then they reach a point where there isn't any temperature gradient because the whole thing is hot. They move up. They, they go to the cooler region up here, and they get pushed back. So they, they, they flow against the particle. And this, this then is a, is a continuous flow. There's no gas coming in or, go, or, or leaving the system. It's purely internal flow above and below and in all directions around the particle. So the optical force is balanced by this Knudsen pump force. And it turns out that they scale. You turn up the optical power, you get the thing gets hotter. Uh, the optical forces go up, but still these two completely different physical effects balance. And um, the particle ends up being trapped. So this is a kind of optothermal trap. He did some modeling. And this is, you can see the thing bouncing off nothing <laughs> and coming back to a stable position. Quite fascinating. 
Something else that we've been doing recently with hollow-core fibers is, is uh, use, uh, with particles guided in them is what we call a flying particle sensor. So we have a system, we have a long length of fiber with two lasers, uh, or one laser split into two beams. We can vary the splitting ratio between the forward power and the backward power. So this means that we capture a particle, send it into the fiber. We can, maybe P plus is higher than P minus. You can push the particle along to a, a given position in the fiber. This could be 100 meters away inside a nuclear reactor maybe, or some very unpleasant place where you can't actually go physically. You can then bring the particle to a halt by balancing the two, the two forces. And by the way, you can measure the position of the particle using laser Doppler velocimetry if you want. Or you could use OTDR, of course, as well, or some other technique. <clears throat> so we can work out where it is. We hold it there. And once it's there, we can then use it, for example, to measure radiation levels. The particle could be made from a, a radioluminescent material. So when radiation hits it, it generates some light. The, the, the fiber captures the light, and we can pick it up here. So we get a measure of the local radiation levels to, to a high spatial accuracy. This could be also be a particle that, uh, that whose the, the properties of which change in response to radiation levels. So it's like a, one of these radiation meters that you carry around if you're in a, a nuclear uh, research lab, for example. Then you take it out afterwards and have a look at how, how its properties had changed. The beauty of this application is that there is no material in the core. There's no material that can damage in the core of the fiber. So, so that this could, in principle, be something you could permanently install in a nuclear reactor um, and, and uh, without worrying about the core going black because of damage. Another thing you can do with these particles is measure temperature because temperature, uh, if you change the temperature, you change the viscosity of the gas. And this then, of course, changes the velocity of the particle in, in the core, giving you a means of measuring temperature as a function of position. And uh, another thing you can do is use a charged particle. You know, it's easy enough to put a charge on the particle. Quite often, they have charge anyway. You can then use, if you apply an electric field, this will move the particle to and fro across the core. And this will change the amount of power that is transmitted, so, or, or, back, or transmitted from the back down to here. So we can then monitor the, if we move the particle to and fro, you would get you'd get some kind of signal that tells you where the part, what's happening, what the local electric field is. Um, this actually works very well, just some, some, some uh, experimental results. Uh, we've, we've trapped a charged particle between two electrodes, and we're driving this with different frequencies, in the kilohertz range in this case. And as we change the, <coughs> the power in the fiber, as we increase the power, the optical trapping force, the optical spring effect gets stronger. So you'd expect that as the power increases, the resonant frequency increases. And that's exactly what we see. So this is at lower power, and this is at higher power, the, um, <clears throat> the resonant frequency of the system. You can tune, you can tune the resonant frequency of this, of this system. And that's quite useful, because the, the resonant frequency of the system, if you want to measure a signal, you'd like that resonant frequency typically to be higher than the frequency range where you want to do your measurement. So you can optimize the system for a particular frequency range. Um, OK, so one simple demonstration of this, and this has an audio signal as well, just for fun. Uh, Dimitri, this PhD student, and his wife uh, partnered on this. I think she was at the keyboard. I'm not quite sure. Maybe she just find this tune on the web. I don't know. But we put a, a musical signal in here to drive the electrodes, monitored the power coming out here, and just to see if this worked, worked as uh, some kind of uh, acoustic transducer. The signal is not playing. Is it turned off again? It's very, maybe you can turn the volume up more. No, I put it right up. I think I did. Oh, my God, I pushed the wrong button. It's not even changing. That's bizarre. Never seen that before. Got to hear this. Let me just. Uh... Oh, I can't get out of this. <laughs> yeah, just being too clever with these this, these computers.
No. Somehow others got stuck with just being turned off. Anyway, it doesn't matter, it works. It's quite fun to hear it. Very hissy, by the way. Um, what am I doing here? So, so you have a very clean signal going in. What you actually hear here is a very hissy signal. Not surprising because of the Iranian motion of the molecules on the particle cause, cause the hissing. So you're hearing, you're hearing the particles hitting, you're hearing the molecules hitting the particles. It's quite, it's quite nice, to, nice to hear. Okay, so my last, last thing, um, and then I'll, then I'll stop, is again, some very recent work. Once again, we're trapping, we're trapping a, not exactly a particle, we're trapping something very, very small in the hollow core. And, and actually, in this case, making something useful with it. Um, these may be useful too, of course, but this is useful in a different way. This is what we call a self-stabilized optomechanical nanospike. There's a picture of it. Uh, what we've done is to take a single-mode fiber, taper it down thermally, and uh, down to maybe, a, say, 10 microns or so, and then taper it down again using etching with hydrofluoric acids down to a tip that has a diameter of um, <clears throat> around a few hundred nanometers, 150 nanometers, so a very, very tiny tip. And the, the idea here was that uh, as the light goes in, that, that it would somehow get captured by the hollow core, and this would then act back on the tip so as to stabilize its position optomechanically. The way this would work, well, it's just true. There's a picture of the the, the, tapered, uh, the tapered fibers, the thermal tapering, first of all, down to a few, maybe four or 10 microns. Then we taper by HF etching down to a tip. What happens here is that the, at this point, the light has escaped from the core because the core has become so tiny. The mode has spread out and is guided by the glass air interface. It then, then gets, gets guided down to a smaller and smaller size. And as the core gets, as this glass gets narrower and narrower, the mode begins to spill into the surrounding space because the core is getting smaller and smaller. And then at the end of the tip, the, the, the actual glass itself is a tiny fraction of the overall, the overall size of the mode. So the mode has become enormous. I mean, the mode can be 10 microns across while the tip itself is 150 nanometers. So this kind of dimension corresponds to the diameter of the hollow core in the photonic crystal fiber. So you would expect the light, when the light encounters the the, the edges of the, of the core, it will then get reflected back onto the tip through optomechanical back action, and we can trap the tip very strongly at the center of the core. And if we turn up the power, it'll get more and more strongly trapped. So the, one of the, first of all, this was just basically a fascinating experiment. It turned out to work right away. Within two weeks, they had a result. But it's interesting in terms of applications because you, you could launch very high power of laser light into this system. So you, you get it, first of all, get it to self-stabilize, turn up the power. And the higher the power, the more stable, the more stable it is. Um, it works really beautifully. Um, we are still working on optimizing this. But in the initial experiments, we got 80% into the, into the core. This at half a watt of power. And, and this experiment involves moving the base of the nanospike by a mind, an amount delta, the base offset. Um, <clears throat> so the core, the core itself is, is of, I forget the diameter of it, but, but this is a sizable fraction of the core diameter. <clears throat> so we move out to say eight microns in this case, or even 10. At the top, there's very little change in the transmitted signal at half a watt. But if we lower the power, we get this interesting effect where as we, in, as we, uh, as we increase the offset, it follows this path and then suddenly switches to another state. And when we come back, it switches back to the original state at a lower uh, offset than, than where it switched. You know, so, so we get a hysteresis loop, basically. And what's happening here, in fact, is that at the, at the, this second state, we're exciting the second order mode in the core. So this becomes a stable. So the, the spike becomes trapped in one of the lobes of this higher order mode, <clears throat> whereas on the first branch, it's trapped in the center, exciting the fundamental mode. Uh, so we are quite interested in this as a as a, as a sort of a new way of launching light into hollow core fibers. Actually, I think it has lots and lots of applications. Um, one of them is, is it, it gives you a very elegant way of, of launching light into hollow core fiber with no Fresnel reflection. You can go from a single mode fiber that contains the signal that you want to put into the hollow core fiber. 
there's no Fresnel reflection. Normally you have to have some kind of gas cell in a window and, and focus the light through the window. You don't have to do that here, and this can all be integrated into a, 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 a one unit with the nano spike and the fiber, the holocore fiber and the single mode fiber are all kind of combined together. Uh, you can also flow gas in and do things without perturbing the optical properties of the, of the, of the system. So I'm quite excited about this, this idea. So <clears throat> my voice is going, so I think, I think that's all I'm going to talk about today. So was that okay, Gustavo? No, I should be asking these guys. You can all get up and leave if you're fed up. No, no nobody's going to leave? Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, so do we have questions? Um, yes, I was wondering if you look at the twisted fiber Raman, if you could see an acoustic helical block wave. Oh, okay. That's a very, yeah, I've, I've thought about this actually. That's one of the things I'm wondering whether to look for. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, um, you know, you, you can create a torsional wave in, in, in a fiber clearly. And uh, if, if the light itself has orbital angular momentum, then it has the, there's the possibility that it can, it can transfer orbital angular momentum or just angular momentum to the mechanical object, and that can act back on the light. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, that can be done. In fact, I think there are people doing this in the optical tweezer field, where they, st they start with a beam that has OAM, and they focus it onto a particle and make the particle spin. Yeah, or you can do that with circular polarization too, and not, not, not just with OAM. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that could be some a new kind of. Yeah, yeah. Actually, some of the stuff that we did, I mean, involved torsional waves in, in this this optoacoustic uh, topic. There is a kind of mode of the core which is basically a torsional wave where the core itself is doing this, and you can use that to couple. Um, you, you can you can use that to to. I guess to couple away M modes, I'm not sure, but I probably could do that, no? What do you think? I think it would be like your, your high soldiers going up and down. That's the, the yeah. stretch drama. Except they're the going to be doing this. Yeah, you, there's also a, at about 10 terahertz is rotational drama. Yeah, yeah. In hydrogen, so you could, if you could drive that one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that, that would be the natural one for, for away M, but maybe circular polarization or something. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah, that, that's a nice, uh, good, that's a good, good example. Of, yeah, nice question. You think so? If you fill up uh, a twisted PCF with a, a dispersion made of uh, an indirect bed gap material, do you think it would be able to, uh, you would be able to transfer this angular momentum to, to from gla glass to light? and somehow from light to this material to see processes that you, you don't usually see on an indirect bit and gap material? It's a tough one. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, indirect band gap materials, these are ones where the momentum of the electrons is not right, so you can't. So you're thinking of making up that momentum somehow using a structure like this? Yeah, maybe. You need to have enough optical momentum to kick the electrons in the right way. I'm sure somebody's trying this in some other kind of experiment somewhere. I'm sure I've listened to lectures on this, but not, not using yeah. fibers, but some other. Yeah, there are definitely work yeah. of people pursuing that. Is it that you need yeah. to generate such high frequency phonons to, yeah. to, to provide that momentum. But yeah, there's definitely papers on, on exploring that. Or idea. you can make, you can you make get a, a silicon laser if you solve you that problem. You can make problem. a super lattice, maybe. A super lattice could, could provide the momentum you need to turn it into a direct band gap material, probably. That would be very small. It depends how much indirect it is, I guess. Yeah, it's a tough one. I think they all want to break. Gustavo, yeah. what do you think? Okay. So uh, I'd like to thank Philip for coming to Brazil. He's living today at one. Okay.
Darwin has something to say. Yeah, uh, so we have a glass here that someone just left. So we found it. And I have like some uh, badges that we reprint. So come and get it. So Dem Damien Presti, Daniela, Salazar, Isis Lee, Mateus, Corato, Sebastian Pizon, Sergio Cotrino, Vinicius Ferreira. So just get the badge with me, okay? And we just uh, passed by an attendance list for this lecture. We'll be passing by attendance list for every lecture. And again, we would like to you to guys to come. We know that there's a walking distance uh, from the hotel to here, but please make sure that you came here and arrive at 8.30, okay? So we just missed 15 minutes of cough break because of that, okay? Thank you so much.